so again, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this special program. Today, we are so pleased to welcome our friend and colleague from the Roosevelt Presidential Library. Jeff Urban is their education specialist and is going to talk with us today about Roosevelt and the Four Freedoms. To get things started, Jeff, would you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, as uh, Joy said, I'm at the Roosevelt Presidential Library and Museum, although I'm not actually there at the moment. Um, we are still closed and um, I'm, I'm actually broadcasting from sort of my home studio here. Um, and I've been with the library now for 21 years. And uh, prior to that, I, I taught uh, at the community college um, level for uh, 10 years. And I'm delighted to uh, to be with our friends out there in um, in the Midwest, out of the uh, the Eisenhower uh, Library, what a what a great president uh, President Eisenhower was. So my job is um, as uh, you know the education guy at the library. I'm in charge of all the education programs from second grade all the way on up to adult learners such as yourselves. And um, we have about um, thirty five thousand students that come each year to the site. Uh, that was prior to the pandemic, of course. Um, but uh, we're hoping to get those numbers back and get things being built up again once we return to normal, whatever that is. So for those of you that don't know, the Roosevelt Presidential Library was the nation's very first library, and it's the only presidential library ever used by a president while they were actually president. So when Roosevelt um, was getting ready to end his second term, Term, he said, you know, we've just been through this Great Depression. Uh, historians are going to want to know how we got through this mess. And so he offered his papers to the Library of Congress so that future historians could take a look at those papers. And when they asked him, well, how many do you have, Mr. President? Uh, and he told them, they said, we don't have room for all that. So we'll take a couple of these, a few of those, and a bits and pieces of that. And he said, no, 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 I want everything to go with one big collection or you can't have anything at all. So they said, well, we just can't take it then. So what Roosevelt decided to do was to build a place to put his library or to put his papers and he built the nation's very first presidential library and this is what it looks like today and um, our presidential library is actually um, four stories tall it looks like it's only two stories tall but there's one story completely underground and then uh, the first floor and then up here in this attic area there are two um, stories in there as well and this uh, building contains 17 and a half million pages of documents, which would be a stack 16 times as tall as the Washington Monument if you stack them all on top of each other. It has 35,000 museum objects and about uh, 50,000 books. 23,000 of those books were President Roosevelt's books uh, himself. So he built this toward the end of his second term and then decided to run for a third term. So he was able to use this building throughout his entire third term and the 83 days of uh, his fourth term. So it's the nation's first presidential library, the only one ever used by a president while they were actually president. And then each president after that went and built a presidential library. Um, there is a Hoover presidential library. And of course, Hoover was president before Roosevelt, but Hoover found himself with some free time after 1933. And so um, what he did was after Roosevelt threw him out of office, he went back and built a presidential library. So if you go in presidential order, they start with Hoover. But if you go in the order they were actually built, um, they start with, uh, with Roosevelt. So the information I'm going to be sharing with you today about the four freedoms comes from that 17 and a half million pages uh, of documents that we have um, in our collection. And our topic today is President Roosevelt and the Four Freedoms. And you are probably familiar with the, the Four Freedoms uh, portraits, so such as freedom of uh, speech, freedom of worship, freedom from fear, and freedom from want. And these, of course, were all done by Norman Rockwell and um, became very, uh, not only popular, really, but iconic uh, here in the country. They are um, usually on display at the Rockwell Museum um, in, uh, in Lenox, uh, um, uh, Massachusetts. 
since I think it is. And um, I should know that because it's not far from where I am actually. Um, but it's a gorgeous, gorgeous place. Um, and, to, and to walk in and see these portraits of, the, of, you know, of all of the Rockwell work, but especially the Four Freedoms is just breathtaking. So if you ever get a chance to do that, um, please do that. So the Four Freedoms portraits got their start with Franklin Roosevelt. And it all started on um, uh, January 6th, 1941. President Roosevelt was giving a State of the Union address as presidents do uh, generally each January. And it was before a joint session of Congress. Um, the World War had started in Europe. We were not in it yet. Um, this is still January 41. We don't get in until December 7th of 1941. And the president is uh, is addressing Congress, and he is laying out his plans uh, for lend lease. He understands that Hitler is uh, taking over Europe, uh, along with his pal Mussolini and their pal uh, Hirohito in the Pacific. And um, these guys have got uh, the world in their sights. They want to take over the world. And right at this point, um, it's primarily China and uh, and England that are standing against the Axis powers, and Roosevelt wants to help them. Now, he can't help them directly because we have all sorts of um, uh, isolationist rules and laws uh, in the country that had been passed after the First World War to prevent us from stumbling into, um, you know, another uh, armed conflict. So the laws are preventing Roosevelt from getting directly involved because we're not in the war. Um, so he's looking for a way to get around that. He knows he's got to keep England safe. He's got to keep China safe um, in order to um, have them be able to stand up to Hitler. So the the address itself, the State of the Union address, January 6, 1941, was actually um, to introduce the um, the idea of, of Lend-Lease. But along with that, Roosevelt laid out these four freedoms. And um, he didn't talk about them until the 17th or 18th page uh, of the speech. So they come late in the speech. And um, it really has become one of the most significant um, speeches of the of the 20th century. And nobody really remembers um, it as a State of the Union address. They all, everybody refers to it as the Four Freedom Speech, um, which is what it, it came out um, uh, as popular uh, later on. Now, where did Roosevelt get these ideas uh, for the four freedoms? Well, it's a complicated, um, it's a complicated uh, field of places that he was able to to pull these um, these these thoughts in. Number one, the founding documents, which the National Archives is charged with um, maintaining and, and preserving and making available, um, things like the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, uh, and the um, the Declaration of Independence. These documents laid out for Americans things like, uh, in the First Amendment, freedom of speech and freedom of religion, right? So those are two of the four freedoms. And the, the founding documents, um, you know, lay these out as a goal for all Americans, you know, as a, as a, as a, a, a a thing that we should all work for, making sure that we have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, making sure that we have um, these rights guaranteed to us in the um, in the First uh, Amendment and the you know the the uh, the first ten amendments, the Bill of Rights itself. So these are things that are are steeped in American history. And over the course of American history, of course, there we've stated you know uh, when President Roosevelt talks about I'm sorry, President. Um, uh, Lincoln talks about a government of the people, by the people, for the people. So these are some some just general freedom uh, uh, themes that run all throughout um, uh, American history. And these resonated quite a bit with Franklin Roosevelt. Now, the freedoms uh, from fear and the freedom from want, these were relatively new ideas. Um, these were relatively new things that came to uh, uh, Roosevelt's attention over the course of time. And uh, these are not enshrined in the founding documents the way um, freedom from uh, of speech and freedom of religion are. But Roosevelt is thinking of these things right out of the gate. Um, so in his inaugural address on March 4th, 1933, uh, he makes the famous statement of the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. So here is a copy of that speech. And right down here uh, toward the end of the first paragraph, he says, the only thing we have to fear is fear 
itself. So Roosevelt understands that when you are crippled with fear, when you have, um, you know, this idea that you can't go forward, that you have no options, that you have no uh, opportunity to change things for the better and to make them, um, you know, work for you, that that is a very debilitating place to be. And that's exactly where the country was um, in uh, March of 1933, right? We basically hit bottom. Uh, with the, the Great Depression. And so the New Deal programs, and there were over 44 programs of the New Deal that actually uh, were developed uh, over the course of, uh, of Roosevelt's administration, all of these programs were designed to bring about uh, primarily jobs. And the idea of creating jobs was that if you created a job, you not only created a paycheck for people, right, so that they're able to, you know, spend money and stimulate the economy, but a job also gives you a purpose. The suicide rate during the Great Depression tripled because people had lost hope. They lost their jobs, and our jobs are a big part of our identity, right? I'm a teacher, you're a baker, you're a lawyer, you're a firefighter, um, but if you lose your job doing that, do you still have, um, you know, that, that identity? You know, well, now I'm an unemployed teacher. I'm an unemployed firefighter. So it doesn't have the same cachet. It doesn't have the same prominence um, in your self-identity uh, uh, of who you are. So this idea of, of losing uh, your job um, ties into this, you know, the fear of losing your job ties into this fear of losing a large part of your identity. And Roosevelt... Um, understood that as it was going on here uh, in the United States. Now, on the world stage at this time, right, Europe is seeing the rise of Hitler. He is now poured over the borders into Poland and into Czechoslovakia and you know, the other parts of uh, Europe. And he's marching um, all the way uh, to the, to the uh, English Channel. And he's, his troops are marching down um, uh, through uh, France and to, uh, you know, uh, Spain. Uh, Spain and moving into um, um, uh, North Africa. So the, the Nazis are on the move across Europe. In the Pacific, we see the same thing with the Japanese. They've moved into China. Um, they've got their eyes on, on, on Burma. They've got their eyes on Korea. And so the world is becoming um, a smaller place. It's being um, sort of uh, put in this vice, this vice of the Axis powers. Um, and the free-loving nations of the world are um, um, being pressed by this and are getting smaller and smaller um, and smaller. I'm getting a message here. Jeff, are you connected to VPN? If so, can you pause briefly to disconnect? I do not believe that I am um, connected to VP, uh, VPN. So I will continue. Um, and uh, the world is, um, is uh, being uh, faced by these, these Axis powers. And what these guys are doing is they are peddling fear. They're they're peddling oppression. They are peddling hatred. They are peddling um, death. They are peddling um, destruction. This is the narrative of the Nazis. This is the narrative of the Axis powers. And at that point in time, in January of 1941, that was the world dominant narrative. That was the only narrative um, that really was uh, out there in the world. It was fear and hatred, death, destruction, oppression, dominance. And the only other alternative to that was, the only other narrative to that was defending yourself against that. So what Roosevelt wanted to do was he wanted to create a secondary narrative, one of hope, one of peace, one of um, uh, uh, of salvation, one of, of uplifting people with a much more positive narrative so that rather than just fight against the oppression and the evil um, of the Nazis and their allies, we would have something to fight for um, as well. Now, um, the... Uh, the world was on the brink of war in 1939, and interestingly enough, the World uh, Fair, which happened to be held in New York City that year, had a theme of uh, four freedoms. And their four freedoms were the freedom of speech, religion, press, and assembly. So Roosevelt likely got some of these ideas uh, from there as well, because um, you know, that was the, the, the themes uh, put forth at the, uh, the World's Fair. And in June, 
of 1940, he was getting ready to open that presidential library that I showed you a moment ago and um, to, to dedicate that, that library to the American people. And he said at that dedication, we believe people ought to work out for themselves and through their own study, the determination of their interests, rather than accept such so-called information as may be handed to them by certain types of self-constituted leaders who decide what is best for them. It is therefore proof, if any proof is needed, that our confidence in the future of democracy has not diminished in this nation and will not diminish. So what Roosevelt is doing there in 1940, just a year after Hitler pulls into um, Poland in 1939 is he's calling out the Nazis and this idea of Nazi indoctrination, that we are the master race, you know, we'll tell you what to read, we'll tell you what to see in movies, we'll tell you what to do, you know, we will lay out the ideas that you need to believe in and such. And Roosevelt is calling that out and he's saying no, that's not the way it's done. What has to happen is people need to be free thinkers. People need to be able to express themselves. People need to be able to read whatever they want to read um, and make their own interpretations uh, from that. And so that's why he um, is dedicating uh, this presidential library because he wants to put on record the records of his administration so that the people of America can see what his government you know, Nazism, right? Like, you know, are you going to ask Hitler, hey, Hitler, what are you up to? Mm, probably not, right? Um, and they're not going to share that information uh, with you. So Roosevelt sees this idea of, of free institutions giving out information that people can then uh, you know, learn from, read from, ingest, and make uh, conclusions and decisions on their own as a critical part of um, preserving democracy, um, and uh, and I, I think he's right uh, in that. Now, shortly after um, <clears throat> he opened his uh, presidential library, he gave a, a press conference in Hyde Park, and in Hyde Park, he was talking generally about now five freedoms. Um, these were freedom of information, which he believed to be the press, and he had a pretty good relationship with the press, freedom of religion, freedom of speech and expression, freedom from fear, and freedom from want. So these four freedoms are beginning to take shape in Roosevelt's mind. He's looking back at American history and he sees that these freedoms, some of these are, are riding all throughout American history as a part of what America is all about. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, you know, freedom of assembly, certainly, right? These are all guaranteed uh, in the First Amendment. And then um, six months later, uh, after this, this press conference where he lays out these five, um, these five freedoms, he's in Washington and he's getting ready to make his State of the Union address. So he calls together his, um, his um, speech writers. And the way that President Roosevelt would write uh, speeches, he had five or six key guys that he would work with and he would throw out an idea, a theme, you know, uh, of what he wanted to talk about. So he, uh, for this particular speech, it was um, how we're going to defend democracy, how we're going to help the, the Chinese, how we're going to help the British uh, against uh, Hit, uh, Hitler um, and his allies. And he's talking about this idea of, you know, I want to work in somehow um, this idea of fighting for freedoms. And so the, uh, the the folks go out and they begin to write ideas and notes and, and um, drafts and things. They bring them back to Roosevelt. He looks at these things. And then at one, uh, one time at a, in a late night meeting, um, you know, he's sitting there uh, and they're discussing back and forth, you know, putting together this speech. And the account um, by one of his speech writers was that suddenly the president stopped and there was a long pause. And he leaned back in his chair and he stared at the ceiling. And um, the, uh, the speechwriter, a guy by the name of Sam uh, Roseman, um, said that he, he sat and looked at the ceiling for so long that it actually became uncomfortable. It actually became uncomfortable for uh, the folks in the, in the office. It's like, well, okay, what's going on here? You know, this big, you know, awkward pause. And then Roosevelt uh, tilted his, his chair back to the desk and he dictated out what the four freedoms uh, should be and what he thought um, they ought to be. And um, <clears throat> he uh, dictated that out and it was written down in longhand. Here is uh, a, 
copy of that. And he basically comes to the conclusion that it needs to be those four freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from fear, and freedom from want. Now, he understands that two of these freedoms are already guaranteed to Americans, but he understands also that the world is being challenged by Hitler and, uh, and, the, uh, and the, you know, the Axis powers. So he lays this out not just as a call to action for all Americans, that if we have to get in a war, because we're not in the war yet, we're still trying to stay out of the war. A lot of anti, um, you know, uh, a lot, lot of uh, pro-isolationism going on uh, and, you know, anti, um, you know, uh, globalism uh, in, in the country at the time. So Roosevelt's hoping that the allies, um, China particularly and, uh, and England, can defeat the Nazis and the Axis powers before the United States has to get dragged into this, but he's not so sure that's going to happen. Remember that Franklin Roosevelt was Assistant Secretary of the Navy during the First World War. So he saw the signs and symptoms of what Hitler was up to well before uh, most other people. So he says, if we're going to fight, you know, if you had to fight for something, these are the things you would fight for, freedom, of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from fear, and freedom from want. These are four fundamental freedoms that should be open, not just to the people of the United States, but to everyone in the world. And um, I've got a copy of uh, one of the drafts here. This is the uh, fifth draft of President Roosevelt's uh, speech. And um, you can see here that he's talking about what these freedoms are, and then he writes in here, everywhere in the world, everywhere in the world. So what he's beginning to do is change his thinking from these are the war aims, these are the things that we would fight for if we had to go to war. But not only that, this is what the world should be based on. So what the Four Freedom Speech does is it gives an alternative narrative to the narrative of uh, destruction and death and um, uh, you know oppression uh, and hatred and murder that uh, uh, the Nazis and the Axis powers are, are putting uh, together. What Roosevelt does is he offers the world uh, an alternative narrative, the narrative of freedom, human freedom, or the narrative of human slavery. And um, this concept of the four freedoms then begins to get played out in Roosevelt's actions, in Roosevelt's mind, and in um, the, uh, the things that he's hoping to do, not just for the war, but for the period after the war as well. Okay, so what this is really doing is it's setting up the new world order, not just to get us through the Second World War, but all the way beyond that um, and well into uh, future um, generations. And you begin to see Roosevelt put together this arc. <clears throat> He's working on this, this framework, building from this idea of four freedoms to where it is that he wants to go. And so he gives the Four Freedoms speech in January of 1941. And then in August, he meets with Winston Churchill and they put together the Atlantic Charter. And this is the United States and Great Britain getting together and deciding what they would fight for. Okay, and they would fight, um, you know, if you were to fight a war, you would fight a war, um, uh, the Atlantic Charter lays out, um, you know, you're going to fight to defend yourself, you're going to fight to defend the seas, you're going to fight to defend free trade, you're not going to fight to gain treasure, you're not going to fight to gain territory, you know, um, there's rules of what should be uh, the way it is in the world, and that's what the Atlantic Charter uh, does. It begins to build off of this idea uh, first set forth um, in the uh, Four Freedoms, and that's in 1941. In um, 1942, January of 1942, just after the attack at Pearl Harbor, President Roosevelt holds a conference in Washington, D.C. We've just been attacked in December of 41 by, um, by Japan. And now we've been dragged into the war. And uh, he says, all right, I'm having a conference in, in Washington. Anybody that wants to fight these Nazis, uh, send a representative to Washington and we'll draw up an alliance. And that's exactly what he did. And the document is, is called... Um, uh, it, it's actually called the United Nations document because these are nations that are united against 
Hitler, <clears throat> united against the Axis powers. And there's 26 countries that sign on to this, this, uh, this document. Now, it's interesting that he's calling this the United Nations, right? Because later on, we are going to create a United Nations. But Roosevelt is thinking of the United Nations right at the start of the war. And part of this comes from the fact that he had been a, um, uh, one of his mentors had been Woodrow Wilson, who had tried to create the League of Nations. And uh, so Roosevelt, but we didn't, the United States Senate didn't join it. Um, again, a lot of people in this country were very isolationist. We don't want to get involved in this stuff. You know, they had a world war. We don't want to get involved in a second one. If we just stay over here, the two oceans will protect us. But Pearl Harbor showed that the oceans will not protect us. And so Roosevelt said, we need to begin to build a new world order. And as early as January of 1941, He's thinking in terms uh, of the United Nations. Now, he also wants to create, uh, at the end of the war, a new world body, which, again, he's thinking of as the United Nations. And while he is at um, Tehran at one of the world wartime conferences, November 30th, 1943, he is doodling at his desk while he's at this conference, and he says, okay, you know what? If we do build this United Nations, what should it look like? And the way he thought the structure of the United Nations should be is there would be 40 United Nations, there would be an executive committee, and there would be four policemen. And the four policemen would be the United States, Great Britain, China, and Russia. So this simple document with these three circles becomes the organizational structure of what the United Nations is going to be. 40 United Nations, so everybody can join. There'll be an executive committee to act as a governing body because the League of Nations didn't have that. It was just all these organizations, all these nations consider themselves to be equal, which is great, but somebody has to run the show. So that's what the executive committee will do. And when the executive committee makes a decision, it will be enforced by the four policemen. So if these guys decide there's going to be something done in the world, um, these are the folks that are going to uh, enforce it. The United States, Soviet Union, China, and Russia. Underneath the idea here of the United Nations, what is this United Nations going to do? Well, it's going to create an ILO which stands for International Labor Organization. Again, Roosevelt understands if you have a job, you have a purpose. If you have a purpose, you are less likely to fall victim to um, you know, snake oil salesmen and such, right? You don't have time to get involved with that nonsense. You've got a job to do, you've got a purpose, you're a contributing member to society. So there should be a world labor organization. There also should be a health organization. So you need to be able to have healthy food, healthy water, clean air, uh, access to medicine, access to uh, vaccines, access to uh, medical equipment. And there should be an agriculture and food uh, organization. So we need to feed people. If you feed people, if people have their basic needs taken care of, that they're no longer hungry, they have a place to go every day and things to do. And if they get sick, something will take care of them. This will go a long way to bringing about stability and bringing about security in the world because people will be uh, less insecure. And he says here, um, you know, Tehran, uh, November 30th, 1943, and he sketches his initials FDR. What we're really talking about here, ladies and gentlemen, is a manifestation of the four freedoms, right? So freedom from fear, because the four policemen are out there in the world to make sure things go orderly. Freedom from want, because you'll have a job, something to do every day. Freedom also from want, because you'll have food that you can eat, um, you know, and, and access to, to quality food. And you'll also have access to um, quality health care, so you'll be free from fear there as well. So this idea of the United Nations, he's beginning to build this arc, starting with the four freedom speech. If you had to fight for something, what would you fight for? These four freedoms. And then laying it out, beginning in the Atlantic Charter, and then this idea of the uh, United Nations coming together to fight Hitler, and then this idea of creating a structure, a body, an organization um, of the United Nations. Now, in 1943, uh, um, 
what happens is Norman Rockwell begins to paint the manifestations, the pictures of these four freedoms. Up to this point, he's just kind of talking about, well, you know, these four freedoms, right? These four key ideals. They really didn't catch on with people until Rockwell came along. Rockwell was the guy that, you know, the old idea of a picture is worth a thousand words. And the first portrait that Rockwell created was this freedom of speech. And he woke up one night in the middle of the night with the inspiration for this. He had been to a town meeting uh, in his hometown, and there was discussion about building a new school. And there was a lot of discussion in the community. Some people thought it should be built. Some people thought it shouldn't be built. It was going to be expensive. And there was one particular guy who stood up and he said, you know what? I went to the school we have now. I'm a successful uh, person here in the community. We don't need to build a school. We don't need to incur that expense. And that was not a popular um, uh, uh, view. Uh, many of the other folks wanted to build the school. But what we see in this picture is, this portrait, is here's this guy. He's standing up against the views of the rest of the community. And look at everybody's watching him. Everybody's looking. Nobody's shouting him down. Nobody's pushing him down. Nobody's telling him to sit down. He's allowed to have his voice, freedom of expression. So this was the first of the four freedoms that um, Rockwell uh, created. Next, he created the idea of freedom of worship. And he said this one was a little bit more difficult because, um, you know, there's so many different ways to worship. So here we see um, a variety of people. Uh, you know, some are young, some are old, some are people of color. Some are clearly praying. They have their hands in the prayer position. Others are more contemplative, right? So we're not going to dictate to you what religion should be or how you should interpret religion or how you should practice religion. You have the freedom to appre uh, appreciate that and interpret that and practice that however you like. Everybody in the world has got that freedom. So this was the second expression, freedom of worship. Now, before I go any further, I want to point out something. Notice this guy right here. Okay, he's down in the corner of this portrait. He's also the guy that's in this portrait here, right? So this guy is making the rounds through the four freedoms. First, he's here talking about anti-school stuff. And then he's here, I don't know, maybe presumably praying that they don't pass the school budget and they don't build that school. But he's in the second picture as well. Then... Um, the next uh, portrait that came out was this one, which was freedom from uh, fear. And what you have here is a mom and a dad, and the mom and the dad are tucking the little kids in. If you look really closely at this, the headline on the newspaper is talking about bombings and such. So the parents are aware of the danger. The parents are aware, but they're not letting on to the kids. So the kids are sleeping, freedom from fear. Also notice it's the same guy, right? So now he's home and he is tucking his kids in. And I love this picture um, because it really just, you know, it just it speaks to this idea of, of the innocence of, of young people and what they're able to do. The fourth freedom, freedom from want, was the one that um, Norman Rockwell did last. And <clears throat> that is this one here. And again, who's in this picture? It's our friend again. He's down here now in the corner down here. So this guy appears in all four of the four freedoms. This was a very controversial portrait when it was created. What it shows is the traditional American Thanksgiving, you know, and the bounty of that. It's intergenerational, right? You got little kids, you got old folks. It's, um, it's extended family, right? Here's grandma and grandpa. Here's Aunt Ginny. Here's, you know, cousin Joan. And here's this guy from the other pictures. And it shows us abundance. Look at that gorgeous turkey, right? The plates with God only knows what's in there. Mashed potatoes, strawberries, you know, who knows, right? Um, you've got uh, celery and these sorts of things down here. And this was actually received by many parts of the world as American arrogance, because many parts of the world at this time, 
we're starving, right? You know, England, um, all of Europe, um, you know, the, the Pacific, uh, folks didn't have enough food, right? They were, they were in war-torn countries. So this one was a little bit controversial as to say, you know, here's typical American arrogance, right? They got everything, right? Ma'am, mom and uh, your grandpa and grandma are here because they haven't been killed in a concentration camp. You know, their families are together because they're not, they haven't been spread out and broken up and, you know, some put in prison camps and, you know, those sorts of things. And they got all this access to food because they are not there in the war-torn areas uh, of the country. <clears throat> in March of 1945, just before Franklin Roosevelt dies in April of 1945, he, there is, he has a, a, an article in Vital Speeches of the Day magazine. And it says, uh, the title of this is A Good Start Toward, um, uh, toward Lasting Peace. And what Roosevelt does in this article, which comes out just a month before he passes away, he is laying out this idea of, um, you know, a good start, that if we have this idea of that United Nations, if we have this idea of countries coming together to talk about their issues, to talk about their problems, to talk about their concerns with each other, two things will happen. Number one is we'll get a better understanding of each other. And number two, we can hopefully talk away some of these problems before we end up shooting at each other. It's critically important to understand that President Roosevelt was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy during the First World War. 11 million people were killed. President Roosevelt was Commander in Chief during the Second World War. 60 million people were killed. And he knew about the development of the atomic bomb. And if the atomic bomb was able to deliver the firepower, which it actually was able to deliver, that they thought it could deliver, President Roosevelt understood if there was a third world war, hundreds of millions of people would die. So he wanted to create this United Nations to prevent that from happening. The president dies on April 12th, 1945. Two weeks later, he was supposed to attend a conference in San Francisco, which was going to lay the foundation for the actual United Nations. It was the first meeting of the United Nations. Uh, it was gonna be held um, uh, just a, a month, uh, um, uh, uh, let's see, he died in April, uh, in uh, March, April, May of, um, of 1945. President Roosevelt died two and a half weeks before that conference. The first decision that President Truman made was to go ahead with the United Nations Conference. He felt that Roosevelt was on the right track. He understood that we had to have a new world order based upon four freedoms, based upon uh, this narrative of hope, of expression, of freedom, of worship, of fear from want, fear from um, uh, freedom from, from want, freedom from uh, fear. And so he wanted the United Nations to go on. One of the other things that he did was he appointed Eleanor Roosevelt to the American delegation. Mrs. Roosevelt was put on a committee, the Human Rights Committee, and she was able to help to draft the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And this is a uh, working copy of the preamble of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And so, you know, they've typed that up and uh, Mrs. Roosevelt has made these hand corrections and things. And if you go down here to the uh, fourth or fifth paragraph, Mrs. Roosevelt lays out that the, the preamble, the idea of this Universal Declaration um, of Human Rights uh, is going to back up um, fundamental freedoms. Um, and these fundamental freedoms are freedoms that all people should have protected everywhere in the world, regardless of international um, or regardless of national laws. These should be uh, international laws. And in fact, she lays out these protections against fear, these um, protections for um, freedom of expression and of worship and um, of the ability to have basic human rights, such as food and those things. So Franklin Roosevelt's Four Freedoms ends up in the preamble of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, a lot of people um, felt that, well, wait a minute, you know, um, this is a little bit, uh, you know, big britches here, isn't it? 
for us to be putting this forth. But Roosevelt understood that if somebody didn't put forth a vision for the world uh, and the post-war war period, that um, we were likely to fall back onto uh, to conditions where people like Hitler could rise again. People like Hitler could begin to, again, craft and fashion um, ideas that they would then instill in people and not have this idea of free, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 critical thinking, free vision, free uh, ability to make and choose your own ideas. Now, certainly the criticisms of this were, so is this too American and, you know, should we really be pushing this? And Roosevelt's, you know, argument was, yes, we are the United States. We're helping to win this war. This is definitely something that we need to do. The other thing was this idea that everybody understood that this wasn't going to be just a magic wand that you wave. And now everybody in the world is going to be good. But it was the first time in world history, really, that um, an organization came together with a document designed to grant every human being on the planet certain basic human rights. Uh, the humankind, right, humanity had come to a point in World War II where we were destroying people simply because of who they were. And this needed to be stopped. This could not happen again, at least not on the scale that it was. And so by putting these rights down, by creating this world body to sort of monitor and take a look at these things, and by laying forth <clears throat> certain basic human rights uh, based upon the four freedoms, and now they now articulated out to about 31 different um you know, uh, rights that, that folks have, but if they all come back to these four freedoms, that this would be at least a, a stopgap measure to prevent a third world war, to lay out a world order for after the war, and to prevent these sorts of things from happening again on the same scale. And you could argue that, you know, these things are happening, right? There are challenges to the four freedoms every day, everywhere in the world. Absolutely. But at least now we've got a vision of how to move forward. We're able to call people out on these things. And the United Nations has prevented, at least so far, a third world war. And the United Nations has been effective. Probably the most uh, um, significant um, uh, example of this is Korea. Right When the North Koreans poured over the border into South Korea, President Truman rallied the United Nations to come in and push them back to the 38th parallel. And today you have South Korea, which is a thriving democracy, and you have North Korea, which is an oppressive dictatorship. So there is the demarcation line between a place that does not have access to those four freedoms and a place uh, that does. So that's why the um, Four Freedoms is such an important document and such an important um, speech. It incorporates all of these views and these values that the United States had and that people in the United States, you know, the founding fathers, uh, you know, instilled and enshrined in our founding documents, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. And then it takes it a step beyond to freedom from want and freedom from fear, and not just for Americans, but for everyone in the world. This serves as the war aims for the Allies during the war, and it serves as the narrative and the goal for all of humanity after the world. I'm sorry, after the war and everywhere in the world. And that's why the Four Freedoms is uh, such an important part of not just American history, but world history. So I'm happy to throw it open to some, some questions and answers. Anybody? Okay, thank you, um, Jeff. If you have questions, you go ahead and throw them in the chat, or if you'd like, you can unmute yourself and ask, ask away. Anyone? Don't be shy. This is your opportunity. Everything you've ever wanted to know about the four freedoms, but was afraid to ask. Well, while we're waiting for people to do that, I, I am curious about something you said. So mm -hmm. I'll go ahead. Um, you mentioned that the Rockwell portrait showing freedom of want was what was considered American arrogance. And I'm, I'm rather curious about that because I, I would imagine that all of them would have represented 
kind of a, an American arrogance when we're talking about, you know, war and, and what people were going through. So what what specifically was it the excess that was expl- that was shown in that or what specifically made that one the triggering one? Well, certainly, um, you, you raise an interesting point. You know, certainly all of these things, uh, all these freedoms were, were being envied by other people in the world. You know, freedom of expression, freedom of worship, um, you know, freedom from fear. But it was the freedom of want, the fact that people were literally starving. Um, you know, the fact that, um, you know, with, with six and a half years of war, there was no ability to, to really farm, right? And any farming that was done, um, that that food went to the military. Um, you know, in essence, you were creating um, sustenance to feed to people who were creating destruction. And so much of the world was, was starving at that time. And I think that the reason that that one was so much more controversial was the fact that you know you you really can you know hunger is something you really feel you know you really i mean these other things are things you feel as well but you know the hunger is something you can't wait on you know maybe you can wait a bit for freedom of speech maybe you can wait a bit for freedom of worship but if you don't eat in 20 days you're going to die Right, you're going to starve. So this huge abundance, the fact that you know these Americans could sit down in this beautiful unharmed room, right? It's not bombed out. Um, there's got all kinds of opulence there. You know, they look back at the, um, you know, the, the portrait. You know, there's wallpaper, there's curtains, there's china. Um, everyone's clean. Everyone's looking happy, and there is just you know one chunk of food coming after the other after the other you know this cornucopia of fruit down here uh probably mashed potatoes or beets down here you know the celery the turkey um this is not this is no way shape or form what much of the world was experiencing uh, at that time so so people tended to have a more visceral reaction uh, to that one as opposed to the other i mean they agreed it was a great idea to have freedom from want but it was just a little bit like mm, easy for you to say understanding um elaine middleman has mm-hmm. asked your opinion on what would roosevelt think about what is happening now <sighs> boy you know that's that's a great question we're not supposed to uh speculate about that um certainly an archivist wouldn't speculate about that um their job is to preserve and present the material but as an educator i'm going to go out a little bit uh, further than that and i think that i think that president roosevelt would be very happy about the fact that um there has not been a third world war i think he would be very happy um with the work of the united nations uh much of the the, the work of the united nations does not make the headlines um you know world health organization world food organization um you know landmine removal uh the uh, education programs you know um, those sorts of things these are all things that the united nations have worked on and are working on even to this day disease ratification that doesn't make the headlines um, you know, what makes the headlines are the bombings. What makes the headlines are the missile strikes, those sorts of things. And the United Nations has been somewhat limited in its ability to um, to deal with those. But Roosevelt was always an optimist, and he would have looked at, well, at least we're making some progress, and at least we have a, a world body that can um, – that can um, – uh, you know, denounce these things and that can create world opinion against them. I think he also would have been very disappointed with the relationship of the of the, the, the United States and the Soviet Union and how the Cold War had developed so quickly uh, after, um, after the World War. Um, I think that Roosevelt felt that he had a pretty good handle on Joe Stalin. He understood who Joe Stalin was and he, um, I think he felt that he could help to assuage some of Joe Stalin's paranoia. Stalin was paranoid because they had been attacked from the East twice in a hundred years, first by Napoleon, then by Hitler. The, the Soviets were, um, were shell-shocked by the war. 60 million people died in the war. 20 million of them were Russian. Um, so they, they bore a third of the brunt of, of the casualties in the war. And the Soviet Union was aware that the United States and the um, Uh, and Britain were developing the atomic bomb. Uh, They were the other two of the big three allies, and we didn't let Stalin know about this. Uh, However, Stalin did know about it because he had spies. 
that fed his paranoia. And I think that Roosevelt felt that if, um, you know, if he had lived and if he had, um, you know, stuck around, that he would have been able to win old Uncle Joe over uh, to be a more um, positive force in the world and not immediately um, uh, create this this bipolar organization, you know, in the in the world of, you know, the, the, the good guys and the bad guys in terms of, you uh, of the Cold War. So I think he would be optimistic about many of the things that have, have happened, but I think he would be um, disappointed that, that the Soviet Union and the United States didn't work more closely together after the war. Um, before I get into Samantha's question, I will want to, I do want to say that that what you said about the United Nations and their, their work that um, doesn't get recognized as much kind of brings me to um, this idea of um, the United Nations, you know, kind of guaranteeing these freedoms, right? But we're trying to guarantee these freedoms, um, but not so much of a, of like a global new deal. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, you know, we've done all this work in the United States to guarantee these things for people when they were struggling through the depression but you don't hear, you know, a, a, a full this full idea about a global New Deal. Was that something that was un, unspoken but expected? That's a great question. That's a really great question. I think a lot of that uh, comes in with President Truman um, and President Eisenhower, you know, with this idea of having to rebuild Europe um, after the war. And the idea was that if we rebuild these places, and create these um, secure areas where people have access to food and shelter and jobs and health care, then they're not going to be uh, looking across at their neighbors, you know, um, in a whole lot of, um, you know, uh, greed and, and such. So um, I don't know if it was so much, uh, I mean, certainly there was, you know, we had to rebuild the war, the, 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 the world after the war, and I think Roosevelt thought that the United Nations would be able to uh, to be the organization that that did that. Keep in mind also that from the United Nations, there were also spawned all of these you know NGOs, non government organizations like Amnesty International and you know Greenpeace and these sorts of folks as well, who are able to work across um, national borders um, as well, um, uh, and, and in, in large measure along with um, the um, uh, the United Nations. So, you know, I don't mean to be a Pollyanna and say, oh, the United Nations is going to solve everybody's problems. It certainly hasn't worked quite as well as Roosevelt had wanted, but you, I don't think you can make the claim that it hasn't worked. Um, it has done a lot of great work, and I think Korea is probably the best uh, you know, example of that. I mean, imagine if the United Nations, what if Truman had made the decision of, no, we're not going to go into Korea? Well, the entire Korea Peninsula would be North Korea now, right? So I think you can, you know, you can point to that as a pretty good example. Okay. Um, Samantha asked, was there a collaboration between Rockwell and FDR on the Four Freedom Images? How were the images distributed around the world? And the comment is, it's still... different to think of, sorry, yeah. it's different Great. to think no, no. about news dissemination prior mm -hmm. to television and social media. Well, the, um, what happened was there was no coordination between Rockwell and FDR in the creation of the, of the doc, uh, or the creation of the paintings. Roosevelt laid out the four freedoms and then, um, Rockwell had this inspiration, uh, for the, for the freedom of speech. And then he, um, he then built upon that and continued out the the other three. What the, the there was cooperation in that once these portraits were done, they were then put uh, on a um, on a publicity. So this speaks to your question of how did the news get out about these? They were uh, printed as posters. They were printed as flyers, um, and the actual four portraits were then uh, went on a publicity campaign all across the country, traveling you know tens of thousands of miles um, to. Uh, to uh, you know, different museums all across the country, uh, so people could see these things in real life. Uh, so people could see these things up close and personal. And if you do, like you know, I, I can show you these like as close as I can with you know this technology. Um, but they don't do they don't do uh, justice. When you stand in front of these portraits, you can see the brush marks in them and the actual portraits, and they really come alive. They really really come alive. And because of this, this um, 
publicity tour that the Four Freedoms took across the country, they raised $130 million uh, in war bonds. Um, you know, people would, they would have war, war bond drives wherever these, these uh, paintings would, uh, would be displayed. And they raised $130 million in war bonds. So that certainly helped to, um, to um, you know, win the war. And there was coordination on that, not in the actual creation, but certainly in, for lack of a better term, the exploitation uh, of what they were able to do. Okay, Elaine had a follow up to her her original question. She says, "Are you so? Are you indicating that Truman did not have a relationship with Stalin?" Um, he did not have the relationship that Franklin Roosevelt had with Stalin. Uh, this is one of uh, if you if you have to have a you know, you know there's certainly things you can criticize uh, President Roosevelt for. One of the things I think you can criticize him for is not having better prepared Harry Truman. Harry Truman was vice president of the United States for 83 days when Roosevelt died. And then Harry Truman was running the Second World War. So um, whereas Roosevelt had had over 2,000 correspondence back and forth with, um, with Stalin over the course of the war, uh, 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 Truman didn't have that. He didn't have the backstory. Uh, he didn't have the uh, the intimate details of what Roosevelt, Stalin, and Churchill had talked about at these various war conferences. He was coming in as kind of a blank slate. And I think that Stalin sort of took advantage of that as an opportunity to say, well, ooh, ooh, here's the new guy. Maybe I can backpedal on some of those agreements I had with, with President Roosevelt. And I don't think that he would have been able to get out of those with President Roosevelt quite as well as um, – as he could have uh, uh, with 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 President Truman, and Truman saw him as kind of um, like old boss Pendergast back in in Missouri, um, you know this kind of bully that was you know pushing people around and such. So Truman felt that he could kind of uh, he he felt that he might be able to soften Stalin and his his um, his uh, his views on that um, uh, and and the post war period, but um, but he he just he is his hand full, his plate was full. You know, he comes in, you're fought. not only do you have to finish out a second world war, but you're finishing out a second world war on the tales of a great depression. Um, so you've got a global depression, you've got a global war, and you're following the footsteps of Franklin Roosevelt, who's been in the office for 12 years. Now suddenly you're the new guy. Huge, huge responsibility. So um, I think Truman did the best that he could given the situation, but he certainly didn't have the same relationship with Stalin that, that Franklin Roosevelt had had. Okay, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, feel okay. free to unmute yourself if you have any, but I would like to point out something that um, is related somewhat. And, and it's the fact that, you know, one of the things that you said early on in your talk was that, um, you know, the, I, that the New Deal you know, was part of this idea that if people didn't have to worry about work and, you know, things like that, their quality of life were, was better. And I, I always bring this up when people are, are having conversations about the New Deal is that, you know, so many things that we hold in high regard culturally, we would not have without the New Deal. You know, we're talking literary works, we're talking about um, art, you know, we're talking uh, music, musical compositions, and even some of the documentation that we are able to study as mm -hmm. historians, as you know, our jobs as in the museum and and used to teach those resources, we would not have without the New Deal because the New Deal gave jobs to artists and you know these people and and, and historians and you know people who would have had you know, who would not have maybe had stable work, you know, they were able to Absolutely. find stable work and then be able to produce, you know, things that we consider masterpieces at this point. Right. We, we have created this um, periodic table of the New Deal. 
Um, you know, most people, if you ask them, can you name some New Deal programs, they'll say like, oh, WPA, uh, you know, uh, AAA. Um, but there were actually 44 programs of the New Deal doing exactly what you're talking about, Joy. Um, you know, getting people to work in a variety of things. Half the infrastructure in the United States was built by the New Deal, was built by the WPA, the Civilian Conservation Corps, um, and those sorts of folks. And I would argue that if it had not been for the New Deal and the New Deal programs, we would have lost the Second World War because we built all that infrastructure in the first eight years of the Roosevelt administration. And this idea of giving people jobs kept people in um, the mode of getting up in the morning, going to work, doing what had to be done. The writers that you're talking about through the writers programs and those sorts of things, these folks went right to work during the war writing the training manuals and they had experience with writing. Why? Because they had been paid through the, the New Deal. Um, actors that have been paid through the acting uh you know programs of the new deal went right into making training films um the uh, the, the the world war ii propaganda posters were created by many of the artists who had you know created these murals and things during the war and many of these things are still existing out there the buildings the hard infrastructure but also these other uh things as well and then if i could just say one last thing um because i know i don't i want to be respectful of folks time but also this didn't end with roosevelt it continued on with president uh truman and it continued on with president eisenhower these guys both saw world war ii up close and personal just the way franklin roosevelt had done and so um, and in a way, President Roosevelt sort of handpicked the two people that followed him. He handpicked Harry Truman to be vice president, and then he died and Harry Truman became president. And by selecting Ike to be the Supreme Allied Commander for the uh, D-Day invasion and having him had have handled that so well and having had that worked, right? And people, you know, failed to re re realize that, you know, D-Day occurred and within one year, Hitler was done. And then we were able to turn our, our folks uh, and our, our uh, attention over uh, to the war in the Pacific. So it was the great leadership of Franklin Roosevelt, certainly, but also Harry Truman and, of course, uh, President Eisenhower, um, you know, who really got the, the world back on that footing after the war so that uh, the United Nations was able to do uh, and continue to do the good work that it does uh, today. So those two guys get a lot of the credit um, uh, as well. Agreed. All right, before we wrap up, uh, B Suite wants you to know that um, he or she, not sure, <laughs> bought a shirt a few years ago at the New Deal store that had all the New Deal programs on it. That's kind of cool. Yeah, that's great. That's great. You know, um, and again, it's there's so many parts of the New Deal, like Social Security, FDIC, um, even the Federal Communications Commission, you know, which is um, responsible for the technology that we're using. All these things created during the during the New Deal, um, the New Deal era. And, um, you know, it's just it's been my pleasure to to meet with all you folks um, out there who are who are members of the Eisenhower Presidential Library family. Um, and, uh, you know, I know you guys are in really good hands out there, um, you know, with, with Joy and the folks out there and also um, the folks at, uh, at Truman and really all the presidential libraries. But it's been a wonderful, delightful opportunity for me to, to meet with you all and chat with you. And, um, you know, you can learn more by um, checking out our website. We have other uh, talks and things there as well. And um, again, just a pleasure to, to work with you, Joy, uh, and you, Samantha, and, uh, and all the folks that uh, are tuning in here today. All right. Well, thank you so much, Chef. We do have a few uh, closing announcements. So thank first, thank you to everyone who joined us. Again, thank you, Jeff, for this wonderful presentation. Today's program is sponsored by the Eisenhower Foundation with generous support from the Jeff Cope Foundation. Our next program is our July book talk where we will discuss The Right Stuff by Tom Wolfe. NASA was created in July 1958 during the Eisenhower administration, so we are choosing to focus on NASA-related topics for next month. With that theme in mind, we are pleased to host Jim Remar as our guest speaker for the July Lunch and Learn on Thursday the 22nd. Jim is with the Cosmosphere in Hutchison, Kansas, and will talk to us about what Ike started with the formation of NASA.
In August, we are going to learn more about People to People International as we host Meryl Atwater, who is President, President Eisenhower's grandson during our evening, Evenings at Ease program on August 10th. You can visit our website at eisenhowerlibrary.gov to learn more about up our upcoming events. Thank you again for joining us today, and we hope to see you at our next program. Have a wonderful day.